Well, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the future of the attention economy. And I know when some of you hear that, you're probably thinking social media immediately, but uh, I think it's much bigger than that. And especially if you think about the flow of attention as having always existed, uh, there's a much bigger scope. But now it's particularly important. So what is attention economy and why does it matter now? The problem is that gaming the attention economy ruins lives or has the potential to. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around the impact that the devices we use have and the value they bring to our lives. And I think uh, one of the important things to consider is that uh, distraction marketing, the main method of marketing that we use nowadays, uh, hooks into our psychological systems in ways that can impact us negatively. So if we look at, uh, there's a very uh, uh, important quote that you may have heard. This is uh, Jeff Hockerbach, who used to work for Facebook and he left to start his own uh, cloud company, uh, Analytics. Uh, he said, the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads, which is very much true in many ways. People go where the money is, and this is where the money is, is in distraction marketing. And the danger with this is that, uh, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna live a good life. There was a great article that came out on Medium just recently by Tristan Harris, who left Google and is now working on a project, Time Well Spent. As each player in the attention economy invents more and more persuasive tactics to keep people hooked, persuasiveness goes up and agency goes down. And there are always systems that are going to hook into our psychology that can manip manipulate us, which is why in his site, Time Well Spent, he has some tips about how you can avoid being manipulated by the visual hooks that companies will use to try to pull you in, which has resulted in many ways of the buzzfeedification of the world, where listicles, where short articles, where things that uh, hook into our easy attention reward systems are being promoted more and more. Uh, Professor Victor Frankl, who was a neurologist and uh, a Holocaust survivor, uh, said that between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space lies our freedom and the power to choose our response. Attention is a major component of, if you believe it exists, free will. And the less control we have over that attention window that enters uh, our brain, the less control we have over uh, whatever small amounts of freedom we do have. And so this is why I think it's so important that we consider our attention economy even more and more, and why distraction marketing has a potentially dangerous impact on uh, the human life. So I don't think it's an understatement to say that free will is about shaping attentional networks and their responses to external cues that we receive. Um, this is a, a diagram of some of the response networks uh, in a child's brain uh, when they're dealing with ADHD. And many of these are present in um, the ways that we're being manipulated by online marketing in this economy where uh, content value is so important. So again, I don't think it's an understatement to say that the attention economy is the battleground for self-determination. And as we go forward into the future, I think we're going to have uh, a lot of different influences that will fight uh, for attention and we're going to have to decide as users how we want to assign value and who we want to allocate our attention to. As the best uh, attention investors, we've got to make our allocations wisely. So the attention economy is used by marketers nowadays, like myself, to get more work, but ultimately it's much bigger than just social media. Attention has always flowed since first Homo sapiens uh, evolved out of uh, our simian ancestry. We have always spent attention, used it, and it has always been a scarce resource, a scarce commodity that we have to allocate effectively. So this is not something new, but uh, some, a lot of people uh, seem to be claiming online that it is a relatively recent phenomenon. You may have heard Professor Herbert Simon, Nobel laureate, economist. Uh, he was quoted in a 1971 talk that became a paper that a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention effectively. But is it really new that our poverty of attention is suddenly getting created by this wealth of attention? I don't think it's a particularly novel phenomenon. The word attention economy was first used by Michael Goldhaber, a uh, physicist turned social scientist in uh, the early 90s and this is the late 80s as well. He wrote that the new currency of our new economy will be attention. We will use attention instead of money. Now that's a bold prediction and he did a lot of writing but was sort of uh, pushed back on by a number of economists because why would we substitute currency, which is essentially a placeholder for value, for attention? I think this is a ridiculous notion because Anyone who knows uh, the value of Bitcoin, the currency, is that it's fungible. One dollar is always one dollar is always one dollar. 
It's always equivalent across. Attention, you could argue, is fungible based on a time-based period. One attention second is always equivalent to another attention second. But the problem is there's so many more subcomponents of attention. There's the quality, the components involved. You have a very complex system working up top. You could be paying uh, certain amounts of it. Your focus could be distracted to a certain degree. So it's not fungible, but even more than that, it's contextual. My attention may not be worth as much as, say, capitalism has dictated that the CEO of a large corporation would be. And so that contextual information means that attention is a commodity. It certainly is a scarce commodity, but it will never be a currency. So this is where I depart strongly from uh, Goldhaber's thinking. And this was sort of nicely summed up by Stowboy, who's a futurist who used to write for GigaOM and still does a lot of writing across the web. Uh, in his post, The False Question of Attention Economics, where he wasn't really disputing attention economics value, he was focusing on this concept of information overload that we talk about a lot which was first popularized by uh, Alvin and Heidi Toffler in the 70s, who were in some ways sort of the original futurists in their book Information, uh, or uh, Information Society, Information Overload, I'm forgetting the title right now. But he pointed out that the philosopher Diderot, uh, several centuries ago, wrote that uh, the number of books will grow continually and one can predict there, that a time will come when it will be almost as difficult to learn anything from books as from the direct study of the entire universe. So attention poverty is not a new concept. We've been worried about it for a very long time, and it's more that now the attention economy is coming into relief because we can finally start measuring it. We have the tools to start looking at attention at a much greater level. If you haven't seen Magic Leap, this is perhaps you've seen the video where the elephant appears in the child's palm, or maybe it's an adult, I'm not sure. This is one of their, on their website right now, this is a class or a gym full of kids with a giant whale leaking out in augmented reality. This technology is funded by Google very heavily, a number of other investors. It exists, and they're going beyond typical augmented reality strategies. Instead of putting a screen in front of the face, they have projectors that project onto the eyeball from a head-mounted uh, tool. And what this does is by monitoring your gaze, instead of trying to project something through the screen, no matter where you're looking and as you shift, they're able to keep the 3D image perfectly positioned within your view. So, the important part of this is they can measure your gaze, and that data is going to be huge for marketers, for people who are measuring and tracking attention online, and for anyone who's interested in the attention economy. So I'm moving very quickly here through my presentation, but uh, the internet is a massive multiplayer attention experiment. So this is the recent uh, F8 conference, I think it's called. Facebook runs, and you can see all of them here with their Oculus Rift headsets, all the journalists uh, testing these new systems. The most exciting part of this is that we're going to start getting data, although Oculus Rift doesn't have it at this point in time, head-mounted VR will eventually start to rely on eye tracking. And the eye is the closest window to human attention that we have. We've relied on very faulty tools previously. I mean, anyone who has Google Analytics is an attention economist measuring the traffic onto their website at this point in time. But as we start to get closer to the neural background that's underlying what's going on when we invest and spend attention, we're going to get more and more reliable data, which will make it a much more reliable commodity. Anyone who's ever used Google AdWords or Facebook ads or Twitter ads or LinkedIn ads has used some kind of targeting system where you've tried to compete in an auction-based system against other marketers to say, this is how much this group of individuals' attention is worth to me but you're lacking massive amounts of contextual information. If you could target in an individual basis, and this is what a lot of marketers say when they go on LinkedIn, is I just want to hit the CEO. I think the CEO or the VPs are the decision makers, so I want to pay for them attention. And if you could do that, specifically target people down to the individual, knowing that it's them on their device and the kind of quality of attention they're giving you, marketers would be willing to pay a whole lot more than just dollars per click. And if you're a personal injury lawyer, you're talking about hundreds of dollars per click. That's one of the more expensive auctions out there on the web. They're willing to pay a lot of dollars for clicks. So what is it worth uh, a whole lot of money? Right now, we create a lot of things via our online investments of attention. There was this 2012 paper by uh, Eric's, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and uh, June Bio from MIT, and they looked at sort of what in the US is the estimated total value of all the free labor we spend on the internet. And their very rough estimation was about 100 billion. And that's in the US alone. If you start to consider all the countries across the planet, this is probably greater than the GDP of every single country combined. 
So there's a lot of value that we're just not accounting for. And that's based on all this attention that we're spending freely, that we're investing between different sources, and that we're spending between one another. And I think the big risk of this whole system is we're not getting any actual value out of it now. We as the user get nothing for our attention we invest. And everyone talks about content monetization. If you follow the media world, you've seen a number of different media groups collapse recently, and that's gonna be an ongoing uh, battle into the future to decide how we pay journalists and storytellers. But overall, trying to figure out as automation and job loss continue to progress into the future, and we have fewer and fewer things that humans can actually do, the last vestige of value that the corpus we own has is attention. That's the only unique thing that a computer probably can't replicate. And even when we do create AI, human attention will be unique in that it is human. And so that's the last vestige of value we could possibly monetize and are probably going to have to figure out how to monetize if we're going to redistribute wealth uh, in another way that's similar to capitalism besides just going for a full-on guaranteed basic minimum income, which hopefully is part of our future as well, in my opinion. So what's gonna happen with the attention economy now? We are getting better and better data about how we spend our attention and more detailed data about that. So we started off with clicks. You could go even further back and just say it was a DOS RAM key entry or something like that. But clicks are the earliest piece of data that we're starting to get on how attention is spent and how it flows, which is extremely limited. But it's so interesting to the point that some companies, Facebook in particular, are trying to measure how much you hover over an individual icon and charge advertisers for that. Although that is debatable in terms of its value, the one problem with uh, cursor uh, location is it doesn't necessarily reflect how you're actually spending your attention. Some of you may have heard of the uh, phenomenon of banner blindness, which occurs where users are so familiar with sidebar or top banner bars that they'll become completely uh, unaware of <coughs> So this is where, and you can hover over them inadvertently as a result, if you're the kind of person that keeps your cursor off to the side of the screen while you're reading. We moved into touch, which is definitely a significantly more interesting data set, but in many ways less informative, because fingers are so big and the mobile screen is so small. So it's another data set that we're using now to try to figure out how people interact with our applications and web devices. The next horizon, which we're very close to, is gaze or eye tracking, depending on what you want to use. Um, and this is where that software like Magic Leap will come in. As you have lasers watching the eye's surface to try to uh, project images directly onto the eye, that will give us information about whether someone's actively attending to your uh, piece of content and how much attention they're focusing on it. Since this is the closest we can get to the brain without starting getting into uh, some of the neural firing data. And then after that, one of the others is going to come first. I predict affect. Effective computing is the ability of the computer to recognize your emotional state, how you're feeling, and some of that's going to be simply an expression data, but a lot of that's going to be in biometric information as we start to measure heat flow patterns uh, throughout your body um, and different data that we have. Uh, probably heat is the uh, most accessible, but sweat as well could be another mechanism to start measuring that. And then as we move past that, we'll start heading into direct neural measurements. You've probably seen this. I'm uh, forgetting the name, but it's essentially a, a simple EEG machine that you can use to control games. You can put them on and you can measure your meditation, uh, the impact of that, although with these kinds of a simple EEG, the value of the data is questionable, but they also have games where you can try to control a, a helicopter using your mind waves, uh, your brain waves, uh, etc. So as we start moving further forward toward brain-computer interfaces, we're going to get direct neural data that will allow us to understand how we spend attention and the quality of it. So now, what does the future of the attention economy look like? Um, this is a very, very rough uh, picture of what our attention looks like right now. The current models proposed by Newton in their 2007 review in neuroscience, uh, annual review in neuroscience. So working memory is where you store several seconds to, uh, maybe if you're lucky more than that, uh, of data that's used to make any active decision. So the working memory is whatever makes it in there is your active attention. It's hijacked most directly by bottom-up salience filters. And these would be things like uh, built-in instinctive things that are likely to trigger you. So a loud sound, a sudden loud sound, uh, lights against a dark background will hijack your attention system almost immediately. Certain colors against different backgrounds are more likely to hijack your attention system. 
which is where the time well spent advocate earlier talks about never look at the icons on your phone, hide them all because the colors are meant to hijack your attention. Instead, just actively search for tools and you can control your attention flow more naturally. So the bottom-up silence filters are external signals that can be used to hijack our inner uh, psychology and, and get closer to the brain. Then there's also the top-down sensitivity control, and you want to look at this as your free will, your consciousness, your ability to control the way you invest attention. And this is the signals that are built into your reward pathways, whatever forebrain control you have going on that dictates how you spend your attention. And this is, to the best of our estimation, you. Competitive selection is sort of the selection process that takes top-down sensitivity control and tries to filter what's going on to make some investments from the top. So at the end of the day, this, which we have little control over, is going to filter your executive control to determine what goes into attention. But external signals will always hijack, always have the potential to hijack your executive control because they have more direct access to working memories and the neural representations that go into working memories. So I want to break it down into, in terms of competitive selection and gaming, there's probably not much we can do here without rewiring your brain directly. So we won't focus on the future of that, but we're going to look at what some changes in technology will provide us more access to executive control, more ability to control yourself. And then the bottom-up settings filters more ability to control your external environments to determine what's going to give you access or what will you will give access to your attention. So in terms of top-down sensitivity, Personal, personal psychological profiling is going to be a big one. We've got early psychology research that's starting to reveal more and more about people. Uh, if you've ever used Facebook, you may notice that sometimes you see some people more than others, or you may have even heard of the edge rank formula that puts together um, who you're going to see. And what that does is that uses a whole bunch of filters, but primarily it uses an affinity score. All your previous interactions determine who you see. So if you do not click on your grandmother's post, you are effectively muting her into the future. Each time you don't click, you're muting her to a greater degree. So what that does is that controls what's going to come in, but uh, more so than that, that'll tell you uh, what you care about. So as we start to profile ourselves psychologically using this data that social networks are already approving about us, we will be able to understand our psychology more so we can make better top-down decisions and control the way that we interact with the attention demanders out there. Effective computing, as our computer starts to recognize our emotional states, it can start serving us information in ways that will allow us to make better decisions. Uh, if you know that you're in a, an emotionally compromised state that will alter the decision pattern that you want to make, your computer could uh, specifically create locks or systems that you've designed yourself to prevent you from making decisions that might harm you. Also, mindfulness education. It's surprising how much quantitative data out there and good research data exists about meditation and its value to increase your ability to have top-down executive control over your attentional state. So I think as we work this into hopefully high school and younger education, we'll give the new generations the ability to have more control over their attention. Nootropics and drug delivery. You've probably heard of there's a movie uh, about the smart drug that he takes that makes him super intelligent to his name, I'm forgetting. But those kinds of drugs, we do not have any highly reliable nootropics at this point in time. And part of the problem is when you deliver them orally or even by injection, it's very difficult because you're working against the blood-brain barrier and you have to get the drug through. So what we need to do is develop better, more targeted drug delivery and better drugs to start allowing us to manipulate what's going on in the brain. Now, not everyone may be okay with that, but some people are certainly going to be using this and it may be that you are constantly using a cocktail of injected drugs that modulate your neural state at any point in time in order to allow you to control your attention to the greatest degree. And lastly, brain-computer interfaces. We already have cyborgs out there who have implants that are hooking into their optical nerves to allow them to see for the first time. We have people who have um, uh, implants that allow them to hear because of uh, taking auditory signals and then feeding them into the um, uh, auditory nerves. So we are already working on brain computer interfaces, but this is going to be something that everyone has accessible to them at some point in time. And once that becomes a reality, there's going to be some ability, because external electrical signals change how your brain works and how your neurons form connections with one another, you're going to be actively modulating the way that your brain changes and who you are as a person. So that attentional control is going to give you more ability to determine where you want to go with your identity and how you want your brain to work. But I think the even more interesting thing is the bottom-up salience filters. How do we control the environment around us? 
we need customizable environments. Augmented reality will be a big part of that. Filtering out certain signals from your visual world will help with attention uh, control, but also if you're just talking about the web, we use simple coded systems that should be replicable in whatever way we want them to do. We should have HTML code that we can refeed into whatever kind of filter we want so that we can see the world in the way that we do. And there are browsers out there now that will do some of that for you, but uh, the web isn't coded well enough to allow everyone to control their environments. If I'm colorblind, I should be able to see the web in colors that are easy and distinct for me and not have to rely on someone's uh, knowledge of web accessibility in order to see the page. So in the long run, more customizable online environments, and as we head into a VR world, as companies drop their more two-dimensional pages or three-dimensional environments where you greet them, it's going to be even more important for people to have more control over that since that's so much of a more immersive experience. And you may have seen the uh, things where people take the Oculus Rift and are going through the roller coaster and someone pushes them from behind. Just a simple headphone and visual system that blocks out your other visual inputs totally disrupts your brain and allows you to be um, uh, influenced by external signals in much more significant ways. Next, we need open source content stream algorithms. Your Facebook edge rank has determined what you like and when you want to see it. Twitter recently introduced an algorithm to serve you specific information. LinkedIn has had, has had one for a long time that they don't talk about. You don't know what companies have decided you care about, and you probably don't think that you care about what they think you care about. Control over that is going to be tremendously important in the long run because all they're dictating this by is clicks. So if you're clicking or interacting erroneously on something, you may have just upped your affinity with that edge within the system such that you see it into the future. And if your edges that you interact with just simply don't give out the content, but just because you're consuming it visually doesn't mean you're not interested, you need the ability to control that so you can dictate how you want to spend your attention, who you want to spend it on, and because that is part of your relationship process, your relationship formation process, presumably, you want to be investing it in a way that's going to deliver value in your life and ensure that you live a life with hashtag time well spent. And lastly, I think this is where um, sort of the earlier discussion on financial tech is uh, going to help social media a lot. We are going to do content monetization that allows us to tell the world what kind of content we value. Right now, it's ad clicks that sell. It's the ability to get more impressions, and that's why BuzzFeed has risen so quickly. They are able to hijack the internal bottom salience up filters very nicely using powerful imagery and other systems like that. But if we as users take back the ability to control that, then we can step in and tell the world what we actually want to see. So there's a the team out there, Ryan Charles, is a leader in mid-chain technology. He has an app called uh, Yours Network. And what they're working on is a system whereby, using blockchain technology, when someone shares content, they become the creator, and then the first curator of that content gives 10 cents to the creator, but then gets 50% of all subsequent shares, thereby allocating value to the curators, and that value gets subdivided each time an additional share happens giving the initial share or even a greater share of overall value. So you're talking about a direct technology that gives value back to curators, ensures creators make money, and cut out the need for distraction advertising, making the current advertising model completely obsolete and potentially destroying some aspects of current capitalist society. But that will be something that uh, they're hoping to launch within the next uh, couple of months to year from what I've read. They called it previously DAC, D-A-K-K, then rebranded it to Yours Network, and I think this is tremendously exciting. Because once we start paying in tiny amounts and receiving money for the attention we spend and the content that we value, we'll create a whole new sub-economy that can start pushing back against distraction advertising, which will force advertisers to start figuring out how to get to us in a way that we value, which might involve payments, which would be my hope, because in the long run, we get paid for all the ads we consume. But that is probably not in the near future. <laughs>